Okay, welcome back everyone. And uh, so John, just to let you know before the panel starts that uh, we know you're here. Thanks very much for making it. I'm just gonna move hey. you, uh, if you can stay stay where you are, um, just out of uh, muted and with your video off until we are ready for your presentation. That would be great. No problem. And before we start, yeah, before we start this panel, um, I just want to, I was given a note by Jean Cannon, who's the curator for North American collections at the Hoover Institution. And she wanted me to flag up that um, they have a new research tool for Nixon Records, which I'd just like to share with you before we start today's panel. So hopefully you can see the screen there. They have a new research tool that she's cur curated and it includes the um, Magruder papers and also the John Ehrlichman papers, which have not been opened, but are officially being opened next week to coincide with the 50th anniversary of the Watergate break-in. So um, very uh, pleased we can share that news with you. And uh, I think there, there are hopes to digitize some of the collection, but uh, you know, for the moment um, you need to visit in person. So hopefully that will help um, direct people to what sounds like an amazing resource. And I think Jean uh, will also hope to be in the audience for some of our panelists later today. So I just wanted to mention that um, to some of you gathered. So yeah, I'm very excited about this particular panel. Obviously it's very close to my, my heart and my research interest in terms of my own book. So I'm very pleased to chair. And we have a fantastic lineup um, today from uh, speakers including Christopher Moran, Moran uh, from the University of Warwick, Jefferson Morley, and John Predos. Um, so I'm gonna introduce them as they appear for their presentations. So initially I'll start with Christopher Moran, who is a professor of US national security at the University of Warwick. Um, he participated in the AHRC funded Landscapes of Secrecy, the CIA and the Contested Record of the US Foreign Policy Project, which resulted in a fellowship at the Library of Congress. And he also held a British Academy postdoctoral fellowship to write a history of Richard Nixon, Henry Kissinger and the CIA, a project that remains in progress. So um, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Chris and if he can just join me uh, in the panel now um, for his presentation, I'll, um, I'll throw, throw over to him. Hi there. Hi. Hopefully, uh, hopefully everyone can, uh, can hear me. Thank you ever so much for the, uh, for the kind words of introduction Sh Shane and uh, you, you you took the words out of my mouth as far as my my opening gambit was concerned uh, I am I'm indeed writing a book on Richard Nixon Henry Kissinger and the 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 CIA uh, I've been doing this for cranky 10 years now and there, there's a good couple of years to go it's it's, it's a huge undertaking it's it's mainly focused mainly on the the foreign policy dimensions of, of all of this than the domestic context um the book, you know, what is it about? It's a, it's 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 a look at how Nixon used the CIA to advance his grand strategy. Uh, it's a look at how Nixon misused the CIA to advance his grand strategy, and it's also the story of how, at times, he even abused uh, the CIA. So, anyone who's familiar with this topic, and I suspect that everyone in the call uh, has has quite a lot of familiarity with it, will know that. Nixon had quite a frosty, quite a troublesome relationship with CIA as president uh, behind closed doors. He called CIA clowns. He called them unproductive. Uh, he called them disloyal. He accused them of basically just reading newspapers all day long rather than doing actual intelligence. He had uh, quite a poor opinion of CIA assessments. He believed that CIA analysts were not on his political wavelength. And like Kissinger, he accused them of um, hedging their bets in their assessments in order to avoid being scapegoated. There's very strong evidence that he blew off the presidential daily brief. And with Kissinger really controlling uh, everything, both people and papers, um, he and Kissinger really put a, um, put a kind of fence or a cordon sanitaire around the White House to ensure that CIA officers, amongst other people, couldn't get in. Um, which really ensured that on a whole host of core policy issues, the CIA, much like the State Department and the Pentagon, were kept out of the loop. And as everyone on the call knows, this really culminated uh, in a crescendo around Watergate, but also with the installation of James Schlesinger as DCI at Langley, who proceeded to cut the CIA down to size, purge many of its people from the uh, clandestine service. 
the question that one of the questions that fascinated me as I've been writing all this up is um was it always that way um did Nixon always have such a bad relationship with the CIA and, th and that's what I'd like to address in in the time that I've got today fundamentally my answer is 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 no um what I want to suggest to you is actually as vice president Nixon got on reasonably well with the CIA um why was that well because the CIA took the fight to communism um this was a period when the CIA um, was not just content with passive intelligence work, but increasingly embraced covert action, something that Richard Nixon supported. Nixon also appreciated some of the intelligence that the CIA provided him when he took fit, uh, when he took trips abroad to places like Latin America in the service of, of trying to sort of protect his, his personal security. What we see in the 50s is Nixon actually um, helping the agency out in some of the agency's bureaucratic battles inside um, the Beltway. Now, this isn't to say that everything was absolutely hunky-dory and perfect. Um, Nulli, Dulli, um, Nixon, we know, was quite often frustrated by the power of the Dulles brothers on the NSC, which occasionally left him sidelined and was especially irritated by Alan Dulles's habit in, in NSC meetings of advancing policy positions. And, and certainly, um, Nixon didn't have the, the, the sort of closeness with CIA that, say, uh, President Eisenhower enjoyed. But overall, what I'd like to suggest is that, is that they were on fairly good terms. And then my second big claim today, uh, and this isn't particularly controversial, um, everything changed with the 1960 presidential election. And it changed really for three things. I'll talk about very briefly Nixon's anger at Alan Dulles over the missile gap controversy. I'll talk a little bit about Nixon's anger at Dulles for giving, as he saw it, JFK too much information about unfolding Cuban operations in the Eisenhower administration. But what I really want to drive home is that the administration in 1960 really brought to the surface Nixon's, what a Brit would call class-based, class-based animus towards CIA, losing to Kennedy, um, a wealthy Ivy League liberal, made the CIA unpalatable in, in Nixon's eyes from that point onwards, because in his view, the agency was cut from the same um, social social cloth. First encounters then, so winding the clock back, as Nixon earned his political spurs uh, on the Hill in the late 40s, early 50s, very little hint I found of, of animosity between um, himself and the CIA. As a, I would even go as far to say that as a freshman congressman, he actually bonded reasonably well with CIA director Alan Dulles. They met for the first time in September 1947. Both men were part of the Herta Committee that went to Western Europe to prepare the, the, the lay the groundwork for the implementation of, of the Marshall Plan. The following year in 48, uh, Nixon met with Alan Dulles at the Roosevelt Hotel um, to assist John Foster Dulles, uh, as, as John Foster, as they were basically looking over uh, John Foster Dulles's testimony in, in, the, in the Alga Hiss case. And Nixon later wrote in, 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 in an inter, uh, later said in an interview that, quote, he was greatly impressed, unquote, greatly impressed by, by Alan Dulles in these early exchanges. And these early exchanges, I think, clearly established something of a, of a, of a reasonable rapport because Alan Dulles, just on the eve of becoming um, DCI in, 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 in 1953, he actually invited Richard Nixon, the new vice president, to give the CIA orientation address uh, at Langley. Nixon soon proved his worth to CIA by supporting them in um, political battles inside the Beltway. So a few weeks into his directorship, uh, Alan Dulles butted heads, as many people did, with Senator Joseph McCarthy. Of course, everyone knows the story here. By this point, McCarthy and his subcommittee were making all sorts of outrageous charges with very little regard for facts about communist penetration of the US government. But when Dulles came, came, came to power as DCI, McCarthy turned his attention to the biggest game of all, you know, the, 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 the CIA. And McCarthy did this by presenting Dulles with a list of alleged subversives and other misfits in CIA and promised to investigate. Um, McCarthy also threatened to subpoena William Bundy, who was the CIA liaison to the NSC, 
having discovered that Bundy had contributed $400 to the Hiss Defence Fund. Dulles was absolutely horrified in the climate of the Red Scare. Any, any kind of suggestion that CIA had been infiltrated by communist sympathisers and spies could be absolutely devastating. Uh, it didn't really matter that, that McCarthy was, was largely a charlatan and that there was no evidence for these allegations. McCarthy was just really, really good at making mud stick without ever proving anything. Dulles tried to solve the problem himself, but to no avail. He tried to do it on a bilateral, uh, behind closed doors basis with, with McCarthy, but failed. So enter Richard Nixon, enter Richard Nixon, the, the, the diplomatic touch of, of Richard Nixon. By this point, Nixon had become much more familiar with um, the CIA's work. And as the agency began to cut its teeth into the covert action side of the business, Nixon quite liked what he saw and wanted to protect it. And, and sincerely, if perhaps a little full-heartedly, he, he, he genuinely believed that the fate of the free, free world um, hinged on these type of, of covert operations. As vice president, he received one-to-one -one briefings from Frank Wisner, who was head of the DPP, the covert action arm of CIA, on matters that Wisner, quote, in Wisner's words, preferred not to commit to paper, unquote. Nixon was brought into um, the conversations about the operation in Iran in 1953. And very early on in its planning, uh, he was brought in to, he, he was briefed on Operation PB Success, the code name given to what the agency ended up doing in, in Guatemala to get rid of our bends in, in 54. Against this background, Nixon had the CIA's back as it looked to rebuff Mark McCarthy's attempts to investigate them. Unlike many politicians at the time, um, Nixon was, I mean, he was, the, he was like a natural political fighter and he was just not afraid to take on, you know, the incendiary senator for in, from Wisconsin. He killed the threat to subpoena Bundy by emphasizing to McCarthy that he personally vouched for the man's loyalty, having seen him on the NSC. And he also killed the possible inquiry by the subcommittee by persuading um, privately the other three Republicans on the committee not to vote for an inquiry. And according to Deputy Attorney General William Rogers, McCarthy fought and griped like hell, but to no avail. So Nixon had helped to guide the CIA over a, over a significant political hurdle in its formative years, and, and Dulles was, was very grateful for that. The relationship grows as the decade matures. Um, Unlike perhaps when he was president, I'd put to you that Nixon actually quite valued CIA product during this time. He certainly avidly consumed it because, in his words, he was convinced of its importance to national security. And at his request, we know that CIA analysts were actually seconded to his office to produce reports of a strategic variety. But what really excited Nixon was the covert action stuff, um, CIA's growing confidence and strength in running covert operations. In October 1959, he wrote to Dulles to praise the DPP, declaring, quote, that the can-do attitude that prevails speaks so highly of your leadership, unquote. And I think I put to you that it was partly through these kind of good memories of what the CIA was doing in the 1950s um, that Nixon got angry in the 1970s. I think his view was, my God, you know, the CIA was so wonderful at Far Eisenhower. They were able to do this in Iran and this with Radio, Radio Free Europe, and this with Guatemala, you know, they couldn't do anything for me in, in the 1970s. Nixon's admiration for CIA was reciprocated. The agency valued his thoughts on how to improve their global intelligence collection efforts. In April 1957, after Nixon had returned from a three-week goodwill mission through Africa, Dulles wrote to him to say, quote, I have followed your recommendations in all instances, on how CIA could better understand newly independent states like Ghana and Liberia, unquote. And the CIA's covert operators, covert operators were, I think, especially fond of, of Richard Nixon, none more so than Major General Edward Lansdale, who Dulles dispatched to places like Vietnam and the Philippines. And people like Lansdale liked Nixon because Nixon was happy for the CIA to operate in the kind of swashbuckling SOE OSS um, tradition. And I, there's one lovely letter where, where Lansdale writes to Nixon and he says, quote, those of us who have seen our enemy, <coughs> those of us who have, <coughs> oh, someone's coughing. <laughs> Is someone okay? Oh, 
is someone okay? Uh, someone might need a glass of water. So yeah, Lansdale wrote to um, wrote to Nixon to say, "Those of us who have seen our enemy up close and know what uh, uh, and know what we fight are all for you. If you ever need someone to help strike a blow for freedom, count on me." I think I put to you that the the high watermark of Nixon's relationship with CIA actually came in the context of his. 18-day goodwill tour through Latin America in, in spring 1958. Before the trip, Nixon was briefed on the security aspects of the case by Dulles, but also by Richard Helms, who was then DPP chief of operations. Dulles and Helms warned Nixon that there could well be uh, mob violence encouraged by uh, Moscow. Nixon was very grateful for the agency's concerns for his safety but insisted that he had the kind of uh, the stomach to face down any agitators. And at first, the, the visit passed largely without incident, apart from a little bit of chanting of kind of, you know, down with Richard Nixon. And on May 9th, Dulles actually messaged Nixon to praise his personal courage in taking the trip on behalf of the free world in the anti-communist fight. But as most people know, things quickly took a turn for the worse. Uh, midway through the trip, a cable arrived from CIA claiming that a communist group in Venezuela was preparing to ambush the vice president to coincide with his time in the capital, Caracas. And there was even disturbing intelligence of a possible plot to assassinate him. Once again, Nixon was very grateful for the security briefing, but decided to power on, power on regardless. Of course, everyone knows what happened. Nixon got to Caracas. He was spat on. Uh, rocks were thrown at him uh, in, in, in the city's roughest suburb. His motorcade was, was, um, was ambushed for about 12 minutes. Things got incredibly tense. Miraculously, he somehow managed to, to get to the U.S. ambassador's residence. But the key point here is, is back home in Washington, a lot of congressmen were absolutely appalled by this and suddenly started pointing the finger of, of, of blame at the CIA. Prince Preston Jr., a Democratic representative from Georgia, demanded an inquiry, saying, the main thing I got on my feet to say is that although we are appropriating large sums for the CIA, we are not getting from this agency the kind of information we are entitled to have for the money that we spend. Michael Feagan, a Democrat from Ohio, even mentioned criminal charges, suggesting that the I for intelligence in CIA was a misnomer. And anyone who's familiar with the history of CIA Capitol Hill relations in the 1950s will know that at this time, this was pretty unprecedented stuff. Um, at that time, when it came to CIA, Congress tended to sign the, sign the checks, no questions asked, see no evil, hear no evil, that kind of thing. And it's really interesting that when he got back from the trip, of all people, it was Richard Nixon who defended the CIA from these noisy congressmen. Uh, he went public by stressing that the agency had provide him, provided him with ample warning, ample warning of communist uh, violence, both before and during the trip. And he publicly commended um, who he just called vaguely a CIA man, a CIA man who had assisted him throughout the trip and said that he was recommending him for promotion. So in the 50s, things I think were OK. They were OK between Nixon and the CIA. But that, of course, was about to change, and it, and it changed with the 1960 presidential election. And there are, as I see it, three layers to this particular beef that Nixon had over the 1960 election as it related to the CIA. One, as everyone knows, was Nixon's griever, his grievance, his belief that Dulles had been responsible for Kennedy's successful exploitation of the missile gap the since discredited claim that the Americans had, had fallen behind under Eisenhower and Nixon uh, in, in, in the arms race. Nixon basically believed that the CIA had given Kennedy um, inaccurate uh, estimates to, 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 to give um, the man from Massachusetts the ammunition he needed to hurt Nixon at, at the ballot box. I've certainly found no material in, in, in the archives to corroborate Nixon's complaint here. But I think what, what's important for me as I've been writing this book is that Nixon believed it. You know, it didn't matter what other people thought. Nixon sincerely believed that there had been foul play on, 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 on Dulles's part, and that would forever colour his, his view of CIA. The second layer of, of, of Nixon's um, beef towards the CIA over the election concerned his belief that Dulles had played politics 
over the Eisenhower administration's secret Cuba policy. This is incredibly complex. Uh, I almost barely understand it myself. But the thrust of it is that Nixon believed that Dulles had slipped Kennedy information where he was able to take a tough stand against Castro and make false claims to the electorate about failures of American foreign policy, which Nixon was powerless to discredit for fear of jeopardizing actual operations. Again, just, just with the missile gap controversy, I haven't come across any material to corroborate Nixon's complaint here. But again, what matters for me is that Nixon believed it. Nixon believed that there had been foul play. And again, this would stalk his, his future dealings with, with Langley. And then the final layer, and I think this is the most important bit, I think the final layer of, of Nixon's animosity to the CIA triggered by the 1960 election um, was that the, his defeat to Kennedy really brought to the boil this class-based hostility towards CIA, uh, a deep-rooted social prejudice that had simmered away in the background during his years as, as vice president, but which moving forward became absolutely all-consuming for him. I'll just flesh, flesh this out for 30 seconds, as I'm sure you've been discussing over the last day and a half. Nixon came from a very hard scrabble background. He'd been um, born on a lemon ranch in Yorba Linda in a mail order house that his dad had had to build. He had to turn down a scholarship to Harvard because his parents couldn't afford the um, associated expenses. When he went to Duke University, he didn't even have the cash to live somewhere properly. So he lived basically in a one bedroom shack and even had to do his ablutions like his shaving in the campus library uh, toilet. And I think just like so many uh, people who, who work for everything that they have to achieve in life, Nixon carried the scars of this early struggle for the rest of his life. And having pulled himself up by his bootstraps, he envied and resented people who, in his view, had all the advantages that, that had been denied to him. The 60 election just turned this up to like Mac 10, um, just absolutely intensified Nixon's resentment of the privileged class. Why? Because as we all know, JFK was the jewel in the crown of that group, privately educated, uninhibited by the requirements of breadwinning, destined for the top by the virtue of his, his father's political connections. He just represented everything that Nixon despised and it, and it needled, it needled the man from Yorba Linda that someone like this should have denied him his, his inheritance. And the final point I'd like to make in, in relation to this and conclude here is the CIA just got swept up, got swept up in Nixon's neuroses about people who had been gifted it all. Following his defeat to Kennedy, Nixon made absolutely no secret of his view that the agency was overly populated by Jack Kennedy types, by East Coast establishment figures. And there was probably some truth to that. George Mac Bundy, who served as national security advisor to Presidents Kennedy and Johnson, recollected about his time in government that, quote, there were more liberal intellectuals per square foot at CIA than anywhere else in government, unquote. Under Dulles, as a lot of people know, um, CIA recruitment really followed uh, a lot in the footsteps of the Oso oh Social OSS, recruiting a lot from the Ivy League talent pool corporate boardrooms, white shoe law firms, et cetera, et cetera. And I just think for the poor boy from a kind of um, a citrus farm who was massively aggrieved at being, in his eyes, cheated out of the White House by the establishment golden boy, there's just no escaping that the CIA, with its people, with its cliquey personnel and procedures, it just provoked the strongest of passions for him. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. That was a fascinating presentation, and I'm sure it will flow very nicely into Jeff Morley's examination of the Nixon-Helms relationship. So th thanks very much for kicking the panel off. And yeah, if you want to go backstage, then you can join us for questions later. I just want to as well uh, contextualize the title of the panel, Every Tree in the Forest Will Fall, that I'm sure many of you will realize that was part of a letter that James McCord um, sent um, at the end of uh, 1972 um, to um, the security chief at the White House, um, threatening that if the CIA connection to Watergate, if, if, if that persisted in the press and, and through leaks to the press, that it would have dire consequences um, for the Nixon campaign. 
and the Nixon White House. So um, without further ado, let me introduce Jefferson Morley. So he's a journalist and editor who's worked in Washington journalism for over 30 years, 15 of which were spent as an editor and reporter at the Washington Post. He's the author of Our Man in Mexico, a biography of CIA Mexico City Station Chief Winston Scott, and the just published Scorpion Stance, The President, the Spy Master and Watergate. So I'm going to now introduce uh, Jeff and ask him to join me in the webinar, and he'll uh, begin his 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Here's Jeff. Over to you, Jeff. Thank you, Shane. Thanks for uh, holding this conference. I, I tuned in yesterday and uh, was fascinated and started learning things and realizing like my thoughts were coming together about Watergate thanks to the conference itself and some of the stories that people told. Um, thank you too, Christopher, for that introduction of, uh, of, of Nixon and the CIA before he becomes president. Um, I didn't go over that ground so carefully. Um, it's interesting uh, that Helms and Nixon did meet um, first uh, when Helms briefed Nixon on a trip to Hungary in December 1956, and then also when Nixon went on his tour of Latin America in 1958. Uh, that tour is worth noting. When he was in uh, Uruguay, his translator was Howard Hunt, the local station chief. And uh, Hunt and Nixon had even met before that by chance at Washington's Mayflower Hotel. So Nixon and the, and the future burglars relationship also went very far back. Christopher's presentation is especially apt um, in introducing the troubled relationship with Nixon and Helms during Nixon's first term, but I think also underscores how remarkable it was that Helms managed to keep his job despite considerable um, cultural hostility from, from Nixon, as Christopher describes, this class resentment of the CIA people um, was definitely transferred onto Richard Helms, but it was mitigated by a couple of things. First, by the recommendation of Lyndon Johnson, who told Nixon uh, that Helms was a straight shooter, he didn't know his politics, and he didn't know, and he didn't care what they were. He felt like Helms had always given him straight information and served him well. And that proved decisive with Nixon. He decided to keep uh, Helms on at a meeting in uh, New York in December 1968. So once in office, um, Helms has to tread very carefully. And it's a tribute to Helms as a manager of men that he managed to stay on Nixon's good side. And he did it in the time-tested way. He flattered him relentlessly and wrote him little notes. Um, Nixon came to the CIA in 19, uh, early 1969. He toured several federal agencies. And um, uh, in March, 1969, he came and, and, and gave a speech. Um, and spoke positively about the CIA and said that he would defend its work, that it was difficult, but necessary for a democracy. And Helms was quite pleased with that visit. Um, incidentally, James McCord, the future burglar, handled the security for that. And Helms wrote him a nice letter of commendation for doing a good job on Nixon's visit to CIA headquarters. What we see in the White House tapes is this, uh, the relationship between the two men come alive. And the first conversation that is captured between them is really within days of the installation of the taping system in February, 1971. And it's a fight. It, Nixon was feeling very sour about the CIA. The war was not going well. Um, uh, the expansion of the war into Cambodia had not delivered the decisive blow that Nixon hoped that it just expanded the war and made America's position more precarious. And Nixon lights into Helms and says, you know, our intelligence is bad. And Helms is practically shouting back at him saying, no, sir, we've anticipated all of this. So things could be very tense and, and, and nasty between them. But a week later, back in a meeting on Cuba, Helms is flattering Nixon and, and Nixon appreciated that and kind of in the middle of a meeting gives Helms a, a platform to hold forth. And Helms holds forth on what a great statesman Nixon is and how strong his Cuba policy is, and Helms supports him 100%. And that was how Helms stayed in his good graces. 
Somebody said yesterday, I, I think it might have been Doug Caddy, that um, Watergate traced back to the Houston plan. And um, I think there is a very strong element of truth in that. I think that the, the type of activities that were articulated in the Houston plan, um, including uh, breaking and entering, surreptitious entry, um, domestic surveillance, um, in all of these things, uh, you can see the precursors to uh, actions like the Watergate burglary. And Helms is 100% with Nixon. Uh, the Houston plan is not killed by the CIA. The Houston plan is killed by J. Edgar Hoover and John Mitchell, who astonishingly enough had greater civil liberties concerns than good Dick Helms. Helms wanted to do everything Nixon wanted to do. Um, Hoover and Mitchell were not willing to go that far. And so after, 19, after 1970, I think the types of things that Nixon wanted done Helms provided to him in a more ad hoc, off the cuff sense. And uh, this is when we begin to see the mobilization of what becomes the burglars. Daniel Schultz's presentation yesterday, I thought was especially interesting as the man who represented the Cubans. He described how the Cubans had been brought into this. And I think his point is very much worth mentioning. The Cubans had no doubt that this was approved at the highest level um, because Hunt was working in the White House. He had a White House phone number and he came from the CIA. He had been one of the most prominent officers in the Bay of Pigs operation. And um, there was no reason to think that he wasn't. Everything that they saw indicated that it was um, uh, a joint, uh, an, an operation, I think he, one of the burglars described it as somewhere halfway between the CIA and the FBI. And that's exactly what the burglars were. They were not, a, uh, that, that's what that was clarifying for me, that that's a, a good way to describe the Watergate burglars as halfway between the CIA and the FBI, an officially approved force doing political um, uh, espionage um, on behalf of the White House but with that component there all along. And in my book, I think that a couple of things stand out for me. Um, uh, one, Howard Hunt goes and recruits the burglars in April, 1971 on the 10th anniversary of the Bay of Pigs. Hunt always said, and the story always was retailed that the Nixon White House brought Hunt on to take on uh, Daniel Ellsberg, uh, who had leaked the Pentagon Papers in June, 1971. But Daniel Ellsberg was not a household name in April 1971, and he was not a target of the Nixon White House. Yet there was Hunt recruiting his burglary team in April 1971. So the purpose of Hunt's purpose in assembling a burglary team preceded the Ellsberg incident, and I think also exceeded it. Ellsberg was not the only target of the burglary team that Hunt assembled then. Uh, Frank Sturgis later told the FBI about a series of operations that he and other burglars had conducted against Chilean government targets in Washington and, um, and New York uh, in 1970 and 71. And um, those operations were, as far as we can tell, not conducted on behalf of the White House. The, uh, the White House didn't have an interest in uh, what was going on in the Chilean embassy, the CIA did. They were actively seeking to destabilize the government of Salvador Allende. So we don't know that much about those because the Chileans would not cooperate with any law enforcement, understandably, because the US government was trying to overthrow them. So those burglaries were never really uh, investigated, but it looks, it sure looks to me like there were other national security operations undertaken by the burglars. And I think that the, what we know now that we didn't know in, at the time of Watergate was that hidden hand of the CIA. And in, the, in, in my research, I came across one especially interesting document, which I just got the completely declassified version of, which is a November 1970 memo uh, about Hunt. Um, and Hunt is cleared into uh, a CIA program called QK Enchant. QK Enchant was the cryptonym or code word for a CIA operation in which you provided operational assistance to the CIA 
you might not be cleared into the operation, but you could be counted on to do something, run a package across the street, make a phone call, do something, and you wouldn't ask questions. So even after Hunt retired from the CIA and went to work at the Mullen Company, he had a formal connection with the CIA through QK and Chan. He could be called on for operational missions. And indeed, Doug Caddy told that story yesterday. In uh, Hunt approached him about uh, opening a, a CIA front in Nicaragua in order to entrap Sandinista leftist leaders there. Caddy turned the job down, but that didn't have anything to do with what the White House wanted. It didn't have anything to do with the DNC. That was straight CIA work that Hunt was doing even in his retirement. It's a tribute to the enormous persuasive powers of Richard Helms that he managed to convince everybody that there was really no connection with the burglars. The CIA statement that the burglars uh, were CIA former employees who the agency had no dealings with since their retirement, that was completely false. That was a cover story for, to cover up the, the connection with Hunt through QK and Chan, and also through McCord. When McCord bought the eavesdropping equipment used in the Watergate burglary, he went to a CIA contractor in Chicago, and that man said, he demanded a letter from the CIA saying that this was CIA business. He wasn't gonna make the sale unless it was. And McCord got the letter. So McCord too had institutional support from the CIA uh, after his retirement. And also uh, not generally known at the time was he also had a good personal relationship with Dick Helms. When, when McCord was arrested, the first thing he did was he called his wife and he told his wife to go to his office and take down the autographed picture of Dick Helms that was in his office, which, which said to Jim McCord with deep appreciation, Dick Helms. So Helms had this operational and personal connection with both Hunt and McCord. And um, the, that is important in when it comes to the title of our conversation here. Um, uh, every, every tree in the forest will fall. That was in the note that, M that McCord sent to the White House. And McCord sent, I think, five letters, back channel letters, four back channel letters to Helms's office in, in, seven, in the summer and winter of 72, indicating his legal strategy and what he was going to do. And um, the CIA, and uh, at Helms's decision, decided not to turn those letters over to Watergate prosecutors because they, they indicated an ongoing relationship with McCord. Prosecutors didn't find out about that until close to a year later in, in April of 1973, um, by which time Helms was no longer CIA director. So Helms bought himself time by covering up his connections to both Hunt and McCord um, far deeper than anybody knew at the time. It's also, I, I found pretty compelling evidence that Hunt and McCord were feeding the information that they obtained from their burglaries back to Helms. Uh, Rob Ritchie and Peter Jessup, two CIA officers who worked in the National Security Council said that Hunt sent Helms material through that office regularly. And it had seemed what, from what they could tell that this was blackmail material. People were shocked at what Hunt was up to. In, in any case, Helms was receiving that information from Hunt uh, even after his retirement. Likewise with McCord, McCord kept transcripts by his own admission of the, of the material of the intercepts, uh, intercepted conversations that the burglars had captured. Um, and he kept those at his house. And when he was, after he was arrested, his wife and another CIA uh, uh, informant, Lee Pennington, burned material at McCord's house to sever the connection between McCord and the agency. Helms was very skillful at keeping this close relationship um, uh, off the public record, certainly at the time of the Watergate investigations. Um, later on, um, more of this comes out, but by then Helms has um, uh, gone on to other things, gone on to his ambassadorial appointment um, and does not suffer uh, the, the same sort of taint that Nixon does of being tainted by the the scandal, but we can now see that the, the burglars were really a joint CIA White House operation. And when they were caught, the White House was really left holding the bag while Helms sk skillfully melted into the background and was not the target 
of the intense media attention, at least in the first year after the breaking. In the summer of 1973, when the connection to uh, the Ellsberg break-in is um, uh, uh, exposed, then the, 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 the attention does turn to the CIA and, um, uh, and um, James Schlesinger and then Bill Colby start collecting the material that would become known as the family jewels and um, soliciting from CIA personnel themselves uh, any reports of misconduct or questionable activities of which there was quite a bit. Um, and um, Helms was always quite indignant ab about the collection of the family jewels. He thought it was folly, but it was the complaints of his own workforce. It wasn't outsiders criticizing the CIA. This was the CIA's own staff calling into question the agency's um, uh, practices and policies. Um, and so that would set the stage for uh, Helms's undoing and his uh, later prosecution. That I think is something that uh, John will cover in his subsequent uh, talk about uh, William Colby and, uh, and, and Watergate. But in closing, I would say that um, I believe much more than when I started this book that the, the burglars were a joint operation of the CIA and the White House and um, that they, they emanated from the desire of Richard Nixon to um, uh, surveil, control, suppress the domestic anti-war movement, um, an effort that Dick Helms wholly supported. So Helms and Nixon were um, a team. Uh, and uh, I believe that Helms had forged an effective working relationship with him. And that is seen in one very brief anodyne phone call that the two men have on the afternoon of June 16th, where Nixon calls Helms to talk about the visit of Mexican President Luis Echeverria. And the two men have a very friendly chat. And so after four years, they were finally, finally working together on the same team. They were in, in each other's good graces. They were looking forward to making things work. And about 14 hours later, the burglars were arrested and things began to fall apart for both men. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Great, thanks very much, Jeff. Fascinating presentation, thanks very much. And I think that that flows very nicely into John Prentice's next presentation because William, William Colby, the title of um, John's presentation being Did Bill Colby Miss Watergate? Colby actually within a month or, or so of the arrest for Watergate was kind of the point person at CIA for, for handling uh, inquiries from investigators. And I'm sure we'll hear more of that from, from John. So thanks very much for your presentation, Jeff. If you could join us later for questions, that'd be fantastic. And in the meantime, if you could move to the backstage area, that would be great. And I'll just introduce John. So um, John Bredis is a senior fellow of the National Security Archive, where he directs projects on the CIA and on Vietnam. He is the author of Classic Histories of the Vietnam War. Uh, his current book is The Ghost of Langley into the CIA, CIA's Hearts of Darkness. And his other works on the CIA include William Colby and the CIA from the University of Kansas. So um, John, if you want to kind of unmute yourself and start your video, um, Jeff, I'm just going to move you to the backstage area and uh, ask John to come forward. So I've unmuted, but the video doesn't seem to start here. Oh, okay. Can you do something at your end? Hmm. I don't have a. I don't have video actually. I just it just says mute or unmute. I don't have a ability to start video. Well, anyway. <clears throat> So uh, the day that the Watergate burglars were arrested in the Watergate was uh, a day where William Colby was doing what William Colby was so well known to do. That is, Colby was the man of Vietnam. The Vietnam War was Colby's war. Um, and one of the big characters in Colby's time in Vietnam, the last part of which was associated with the pacification program and the Phoenix program and what was called the Civil Operations and Revolutionary Development uh, 
agency uh, was a man named John Paul Van, who was killed during the fighting in Vietnam in the Easter Offensive of 1972. Van's funeral took place in Washington uh, the day before the day of uh, the Watergate break-in and when the burglars were uh, arrested. So Colby wasn't paying attention. And actually, that's the larger theme that weaves through the CIA's treatment of the Watergate affair. Colby himself says, well, he knew when he heard the news of this uh, arrest of these burglars, that this was gonna be a big subject at the uh, staff meeting on Monday. It was a Saturday when this happened. And sure enough, it was the big subject at the staff meeting on Monday. And Colby came away from that staff meeting. He was back in Washington now, back at CIA headquarters, and he was the executive director of the agency. That was a, uh, uh, a job that put Colby in um, the sort of liaison seat, the sort of uh, intermediary seat between things happening in the CIA and things happening in the outside world. Helms, gave Colby an assignment at that staff meeting, which was uh, to uh, ascertain certain information about one little slice of the Watergate situation. But in fact, within a week of the arrest of the burglars, Colby had emerged as the point man at the CIA for all things Watergate. Now, given his job as executive director of the agency, there were uh, a host of issues that were coming up at this particular time to engage Mr. Colby and to distract him from this whole Watergate situation. So part of the problem in uh, identifying the degree to which the CIA was implicated in Watergate or was uh, responsible for Watergate or put in an adjective of your choice is the question of uh, how much sort of spare attention did the agency have to devote to this? If you take Colby as your measure, you might decide that it was not much. Here's the thing, Vietnam was already on the table. Vietnam was highly controversial. As a matter of fact, back up a few months before the Watergate thing breaks open, one of Colby's main issues is uh, the question of whether in pacification in Vietnam, the Phoenix program was an assassination program. And starting in January of 1972, there was a, 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 blue, a controversy blew up as a result of uh, press allegations in the magazine Parade and in other uh, sources that made that exact charge. And if you look at what happened inside the CIA in connection with this, you'll see that Colby spent weeks working on a series of drafts of denunciations and denials of these charges. That was clear evidence that uh, he was uh, to a great degree concerned about these issues and uh, uh, spending a lot of his attention on them. There's also uh, other things coming up in the agency at the same time. 
As uh, Jeff referred to during his talk, Mr. Helms was leaving Langley and going to Tehran as the US ambassador. So there was a new director of the CIA. That director, James R. Schlesinger, was not an intelligence professional and was a, a neophyte, especially in terms of these kinds of uh, uh, controversies and uh, sort of quiet uh, initiatives, shall we call them, that the uh, intelligence, that the spooks were up to. Um, Schlesinger was uh, challenged by uh, congressional figures and by newsmen who were asking him questions about things that he didn't have any idea of. Colby, as the executive director, was the guy who was supposed to be on top of all of this stuff and um, was the guy who was increasingly preoccupied by the series of things that were coming up in his bailiwick, of which Watergate was the latest one. So if you go back to the day that uh, the burglars were arrested and you start moving forward into the next year, what you find is that uh, the Watergate developments, the continuing series of uh, revelations and the drip of new controversies that bubble up during this period of time coincide with other streams of revelations and developments that are also implicating the CIA in a variety of other uh, areas, be they assassinations in Vietnam or political interventions in South America uh, and other places. And all of this is going on. Now, if you turn around and you look at Colby's performance as, quote unquote, the point man on Vietnam, you see that he has several main uh, points of uh, intervention. One comes in December of 1972, where uh, uh, John Ehrlichman, Nixon's assistant, his domestic assistant at the White House, calls Helms and Colby into the White House to meet with him and John Dean about uh, the, uh, the range of CIA issues. At that point, one of the most important being the degree of agency support for Mr. Hunt and Mr. Liddy in their operations in California against Ellsberg psychiatrists. Another uh, Colby uh, point of contact with this issue is the question of the uh, psychological profiles that were done of Daniel Ellsberg. There you find that the CIA tried hard to get uh, those who were investigating the psychological profiles to not question the agency's point man for Vietnam, a fellow named George Carver. Another thing was the relations between the agency and the Watergate burglars, whom, uh, as Jeff mentioned, were uh, people who had been associated with the agency's Cuba program. There was a lot of interest in the Justice Department uh, and the FBI uh, on um, questioning agency people who had been involved in the Cuba program, including, for example, the case officers who had worked with Eugenio Martinez and uh, Jake Esterlein, the uh, uh, task force chief uh, at the, the Miami station, who had been a, a leader in the uh, Cuba program. They did actually get to uh, uh, question Esterlein, but this was after some months of negotiations back and forth between Langley 
and Justice Department officials. The um, whole issue of the Watergate burglars and their CIA connections, which is central to Jeff Morley's argument about uh, what was the sort of political position of uh, this operation suspended between the agency and the White House, uh, that became increasingly uh, dominant as the Watergate issue uh, when the Ellsberg trial evaporated upon revelation of the fact that uh, Fielding's office, the psychiatrists in California, um, had been burgled by these uh, White House burglars. So um, as you go into 1973 uh, and you go through 1973, you start with this uh, concatenation of uh, controversies that become more and more intertwined and more and more serious. And then the agency director, uh, James Schlesinger, gets pulled away by Mr. Nixon, who sends him to the Pentagon as the Secretary of Defense, and then makes Bill Colby himself the, uh, uh, the director of the CIA. As director of the CIA, Colby still has the same problems that he had had before. In addition to which, he's got this new problem, which is that Mr. Schlesinger, before departing from uh, uh, the CIA, had asked everyone in the organization to come bring him instances of where the agency uh, had been involved in domestic matters. And that led to a new controversy about uh, the CIA document that has come down in history as the family jewels, where uh, the agency was uh, uh, basically revealing, was a self-revelation, if you like, um, all these agency departments bring to the director what they were called of uh, sensitive uh, domestic uh, interventions by the CIA. And that became a whole new front associated with Watergate, associated with Vietnam, uh, and the whole thing uh, boiling over when uh, Cy Hirsch published his revelations based on the family jewels that brought on the year of intelligence in 1975. So looking back on this period, I think that you can make a good argument that Bill Colby was overwhelmed by uh, the pace and uh, scope of the revelations of CIA wrongdoing far beyond anything he had imagined and that this helped set the stage for what happened beyond Watergate, which was an inquiry into the whole basis for the operations of intelligence by the US government. And I'll leave it there. Let's throw uh, the floor open to discussion. Hello? Oh, okay. Hi, John. Yes, yeah, I was just backstage and, and ushering Jeff and Chris, Chris to join us. Um, so sorry your camera's not working, John, but um, that uh, it was a really fascinating presentation as well. So thanks a lot. And I think the, the three the three of you together give us an amazing chronology of the uh, the evolving relationship between Nixon and Helms and then CIA as an institution um, through these years. So um, I'd like to kick off um, maybe by looking at the CIA reaction to Watergate, leaving aside for the moment, well, the question of foreknowledge within CIA by Helms or others of the, of the break-in. I wonder what we have to say about the, the immediate reaction of CIA. Obviously, there's the uh, anonymous letter or unsigned letter from McCord that I think comes in in July 1972, which after consulting the agency lawyer, uh, 
Lawrence Houston, they decided to, to deep six and not disclose for many months, um, yeah. maybe more than a year. So that's the beginnings of Helms trying to distance, distance himself from any, um, any CIA involvement in the Watergate investigation and to try and keep the, the CIA out of it and not damage their reputation and get them sort of sucked into it, even though the White House was in some ways trying to use them to deflect attention. Um, away from the White House um, as a kind of counter maneuver. So I, I just wonder if, if we could get your thoughts initially on that from each of the panelists. Well, I, I was struck by the fact that um, despite his account, you know, Helms really tries to oblige Nixon in the first weeks of the cover up um, and, 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 and supports and sends Dick Walters to see Pat Gray and tells him to taper off the investigation. So. <clears throat> That was something that Helms was would, and, and, and Walters were willing to say orally. But when Dean pressed them and, and Gray pressed them to put it in writing, um, uh, they wouldn't do it. And, and that's when at, after a couple of weeks, they start to back off and they don't help Nixon. Um, uh, Helms mostly helped himself by making sure that the FBI didn't interview the, the CIA officers who had supported Hunt and Liddy on the Ellsberg break in. So Helms protected that operation in the, uh, uh, in the early days after the cover-up. So that's what I thought was most interesting about the, the reaction was Helms wanted to be helpful to Nixon he, and he tried, but he was not gonna put his agency at risk. And so he only went so far. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, John, Chris, do you wanna come in on this one? Uh, no, I'll pass. Okay. I, I, I can say something very briefly. I mean, I, I confess I, I, I'm more interested in sort of the, 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 the Nixon, Kissinger, CIA foreign policy dimension than the, 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 the sort of the Watergate picture of all of this. What, what I would say is that um, very quickly, Dick Helms' instruction to the CIA when it came to Watergate was stay the hell away from it. Yeah. Stay the hell away from it. I don't want anyone talking about Watergate. I don't want anyone uh, answering phone calls from any journalist or anyone about Watergate. And this is classic Helms. This, this is classic Helms. You know, Cla Helms was, um, was probably the American aficionado of, of absolute secrecy. You know, he, 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 he truly, you know, he, 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 to quote Thomas Powers, he was the man who kept the secrets. He was someone that um, sort of contra Alan Dulles, who, who, who believed that you say absolutely nothing about uh, CIA activity whatsoever, even in the vaguest of terms. But what happened over time, of course, is that um, by not saying anything, um, the vacuum, the public knowledge vacuum was filled by, was filled by journalists, was filled by some more conspiratorial voices. So very, very quickly, the CIA got engulfed in the whole Watergate scandal. And suddenly then it was the CIA, perhaps, rather than the Nixon White House, who became sort of enemy number one of, of, of this particular crisis. And I think as a result of that, one of the lessons the CIA learned from that is actually there are dangers of, of, of staying completely silent when scandals break. Um, and I think moving forward, what we see, perhaps with an interregnum during the Bill Casey years in the 80s, when they sort of roll back to the sort of Helms era, devotion to secrecy. The longer term implication of, of, of Watergate is that the CIA, when something bad breaks, will offer some sort of comment, will offer some sort of statement to put things um, in a different frame, to give their point of view, because they recognise that, you know, um, sometimes if you can't beat them, you have to join them. Uh, yeah. And there are dangers to saying nothing. Yeah. Let me say something here now. Yeah. Um, what Christopher says uh, is reflected actually, <coughs> excuse me, in uh, what uh, Colby does. Helms is in I think you've muted yourself, John, maybe? No, I hope not. Okay, okay. Back, let me back, say this. Um, Helms's directions are reflected in Colby's activities. When Colby takes this job as executive director and point man on Watergate, the, 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 the content of his actions, such as they are, is exactly in line with Helms' instructions. For example, um, 
he tries to avoid the CIA responding to questions from the FBI field office that's investigating Watergate and only have the agency respond to the very top echelon of FBI uh, leadership. And same thing with White House staff. We won't talk to the lower White House staff. We'll barely meet with John Dean, uh, but we'd prefer to deal with uh, uh, Mr. Ehrlichman directly. So he tries uh, to do uh, Helms's bidding uh, on this in this regard. And I think maybe he comes away from that with the lesson that it was a mistake not to deal with these people. You know, later on, there's a whole and a deep conflict between Mr. Colby and Mr. Helms in retrospect about uh, what went on during this period of time. And in particular, the 1975 period where Watergate figures in the controversy about intelligence and intelligence leadership. And everyone is accusing Colby of giving away the store. And Colby's giving away the store is about what Colby learned from Watergate, i.e. don't just keep your mouth shut. Yeah. I mean, another another element of that that you touched on, um, John, is the the, the photographs um, taken by Hunt uh, on the um, the fielding um, break-in casing, um, mm -hmm. where also they had equipment from CIA and they had a, a um, camera hidden in a, in a tobacco pouch. I mean, the whole the whole narrative around that, how figures within CIA kept copies of the Xerox photos. Um, the Xerox copies of the photos taken during that casing, they had them in hand for months and months, didn't seem to realize what they were or what they indicated and, and how that equipment had been used on this mission. And then basically dissembled, um, you know, when they, when they were then later uh, given copies uh, of those to Silbert and Peterson. And then Silbert and Peterson themselves seemed to not realize what these photos mean either. So it, it I guess the, um, the bottom line is that the the truth about the the fielding break in didn't come out until much later than it might have, if either had CIA had been more open about it or the investigators themselves had realized what they had in their hands with the registration of Dr. Fielding literally there in the photo waiting to be followed up, but somehow somehow it was missed or overlooked or or hidden, you know. Uh, so I, I wonder what our feelings are on that as well. I thought I think that's, that's a good point. point. Yeah. You go ahead, Jeff. Um, I, I, I think that that's a crucial point because had things like the Ellsberg break-in come out at the same time or shortly after the burg after the after the burglary after the arrest of the burglars, you know the scandal might have been defined from the start as a CIA scandal. Particularly if the if the if it, if it had become known that McCord had burned CIA records at or McCord's wife had burned CIA records at his house. If, if those two facts had come out in June or July of 1972, the Watergate scandal would have been a CIA scandal as much as a White House scandal. And, um, uh, and that might have changed kind of the original framing of it. The CIA angle doesn't develop until about a year later when the back channel to McCord is exposed and the support for the, for the break-in at Ellsberg Psychiatrist is exposed. Then the CIA becomes the tar real target of investigation and concern. But by covering up those things early on, Helms really saved himself. I think he saved his job and he saved himself a world of trouble. And the, and the scandal became you know, the White House burglars, not the CIA burglars. Yeah, and I mean, in terms of chronology, the, the, the burglars trial was kind of January. Um, the sentencing was in March. McCord's letter to Sirica was in March. But then um, I think the the, you know, the public surfacing of these photographs didn't happen until late April, and and, and yeah. then the Ellsberg um, prosecution, you know, that was thrown out a couple of weeks later. So it's interesting in terms of the chronology of all this. If if I could throw in one more thing, um, Shane, I got from your book. You pointed out the existence of Earl Silbert's diary, um, which is a fascinating and important document, and I think Earl Silbert is here. I. 
if, if he's listening in, thank you, sir, for that document. It is fascinating to see the scandal unfold in your eyes. And I think especially interesting in that is uh, Silbert describing his relations in these conferences with Helms, who is uh, the consummate slippery operator and constantly deflecting attention away from seemingly minor things, but par all part of this effort to make sure that the scandal is the White House burglars, not the CIA burglars. So, um, uh, and I think the diary really shows that, how, how Helms did that in those closed door meetings with Silbert and Peterson. Yeah, that, 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 there's a lovely line um, in, in the Helms memoir, a look over my shoulder. I, I believe it's page 381. I, I don't know why I, I, I remember that, why it's etched into my memory <laughs> bank. I've got no idea. But, but Helms, Helms describes the, um, the moment when he first met Nixon at the White House uh, after Nixon had become president on the 30th of January, 1969, when he went to brief um, Nixon and Kissinger on ongoing CIA operations. And towards the end of the briefing, conversation turned to some of the CIA's riskier operations. Uh, the briefing concluded, and it's there in Helms's memoir, that at the moment when he was sort of picking up his papers and, uh, and, and walking towards the door, Nixon hollered to Helms, don't get caught. <laughs> Don't get caught. And, and, yeah. and in a lovely sort of line in Helms's memoir, he says, the full irony of that statement did not become clear to me for another three or four years. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. I um, have a question for our fellow panelists. Uh -huh. Now, um, <clears throat> what do you make of the uh, reaction of the characters in our story and or of the CIA to investigators like Howard Baker, one of the first congressional people to really zero in on the CIA role and uh, try and feel it out. Uh, I mean, for me, Baker's investigation of the CIA reflected in his appendix to the Senate Watergate report was a starting point for trying to understand the agency's role in the in, in, in the burglary and, and, and related events. And so, um, you know, Baker's concerns at the time were dismissed. And I remember thinking he's just carrying water for Nixon. Um, and that was true, he was, but he was also intuited that the CIA role, he intuited accurately that the CIA role was much bigger. And he famously said, there's animals crashing around in the forest. I can hear them, but I can't see them referring to, to the CIA connection to Watergate. So Baker's skepticism about the official story was, a, for me, a starting point that you know, was very productive. I talked to people on the Watergate committee who thought you know, he was a bit of a conspiracy theorist and some of his leads were dead, but a lot of the story that we now know, like the back channel to McCord, for example, um, you know, were really come out and, and, and Baker investigated and, and, and fully you know, told that story, which revealed something about the CIA's hidden hand. Yeah, and I mean, I, I came to have great respect for um, Senator Baker because, you know, initially I think he, he didn't think there was a direct some connection to Watergate and he believed he was telling the truth, but then gradually as he realized the weight of connection to the White House and he went further and further into it, he was truly bipartisan in terms of these investigations and let the chips were fall where they may. And he pushed the, invest the investigation into possible CIA connection to Watergate, you know, in, in, in extremely, to extremely deep dimensions where he got access to a whole load of CIA documentation. I think possibly only Daniel Schultz, the attorney for the burglars, also have access to. And that now be has become part of the uh, public record and helped um, researchers like ourselves to, to really look at the internal history of the Watergate scandal from within CIA and what was the paper trail and what was the response? And, you know, it's really enriched our whole understanding of it, I think. Um, John, just going back to the, um, the fielding break-in, did you have anything to add on that one? On the fielding break-in? Yeah, um, that, and the photographs specifically and, and why it took so long for them to surface. Colby's version is that uh, he saw these things when the uh, agency technical specialists handed him a package of material. This is what we did for Hunt. Um, 
he says he didn't realize that they were of any importance. And it wasn't until months later when um, someone handed him a file, which was about uh, consolidating the material on Hunt, that he looked again at this material and it had this other meaning. On the other hand, the CIA's internal study of the Watergate affair is uh, um, not ambiguous, but confusing. At one point, it says that they made copies of the photographs, but at another point, it says they made Xerox copies of the photographs and that the Xeroxes were particularly of particularly poor quality. And uh, of course, uh, the other side of this is the White House side of this, where the White House knew that, uh, um, you know, Hunt and uh, uh, Liddy, Liddy were going off to, to surveil Fielding's um, office, so that when they saw the photographs, they immediately knew what this was all about. So, it's confusing what to make of this because the, uh, the attitude that I was describing before where we're not gonna cooperate with uh, investigators and we're gonna keep the contacts to the highest level uh, is, conflicts with the idea that it was ignorance that kept them from understanding what they had in their hands here when they were looking at the fielding material. I'm not sure uh, what to make even at this late date. I was always skeptical of the story that, that they didn't know what to make of those. I mean, these are men who were masters of surreptitious entry. They were dealing with a surreptitious yes. entry by former CIA people. They're shown casing photographs. I just don't believe that they didn't know that. I think that that was a very clever Helms description of what might have happened, but I don't think that's what happened. I think they knew that they were photographed. And I think Shane, you pointed out, wasn't it that, um, didn't Kara Messinas also see those photographs when he met with Hunt one time? Um, I believe he may have seen them, yeah. I mean, the, yeah. the, the, the CIA definitely, they kept Xerox copies of the photographs. Um, yeah, well, and I think the negatives probably got destroyed at some point, but uh, they had the Xerox copies, including the blow up of the car registration, literally, you know, um, identifying um, Fielding's car. And uh, I think Colby at one point in, in one of the papers had suggested that it seemed like a California location, possibly the Rand Corporation. But, you know, that level of vagueness um, where, you know, people like ourselves can just look at that car reg, which says Beverly Hills and identify <laughs> it almost instantly. Yeah. It's kind of bizarre to me. Um, so yeah, there was a level of dissembling that um, was, was kind of curious to say the least. Um, just, 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 just a very small point, if, if yeah. I may, Shane, it, it just occurred to me, my memory of, of, of Colby's memoir, Honourable Men, the, the only silver lining perhaps, perhaps of Watergate for the CIA whilst, while Nixon was still in office was that the, the scandal became so all consuming for Nixon that while he was in office, he actually wasn't really in power for those last eight, last 18 months. And the result of that was that when it came, I mean, this is this is quite literally quoting direct from Kissinger. When it came to foreign affairs, it was Kissinger who was in charge, not Nixon. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you take the, the Arab-Israeli war in late, um, late 73, it, it was Kissinger remarkably who put uh, the United States on DEFCON 3, not the president of the United States, not the commander in, in, in chief. And Colby says in... Um, and I think Helby, Hel, uh, Helms also acknowledged this in him, his memoirs. They had a much be better relationship with Kissinger. Uh, not perfect, but they had a much better relationship with Kissinger than they ever did, than they ever did with, with, with Nixon. So I think they took some comfort from the fact that potentially a more stable figure was, uh, w w had their hands, was, was, was sort of the guardian of national security for those 18 months while Watergate was rumbling on. Yeah, that's true. I mean, particularly after the revelation of the Nixon tapes and, and then the whole um, brouhaha over that. OK, I'm going to go to a couple of questions from the audience as we have about six minutes left. So um, from Francesca Akhtar, um, did Bernard Barker ever speak publicly about his involvement in Watergate, either when in prison or afterwards? 
Well, I mean, I can answer, I can answer that. He, he did testify in front of the Senate Watergate Committee, and he was pretty open in terms of what his story was. Um, I think as we as we learned yesterday, um, I think the, the Miami burglars had honorable intentions. They thought it was a national security operation um, from some undefined agency within the White House Hunt was leading, um, not specifically according to Hunt, CIA or FBI, because they didn't have the, either the charter or they weren't led by Hoover to do these kind of bag jobs. So that was the story they were given. Um, but, you know, happy for a panelist to add to that, if you'd like. Um, I was struck by and, and quote in my book, one comment from Barker where um, McCord and Hunt are going crazy after they've been arrested and they're demanding money and they're threatening to do this. And Barker is much more fatalistic. And he tells McCord, he says, Jimmy, just take it, you know, just shut up and take it. There's no other way to deal with this. We're not going to do anything. And he, he says something that I thought was very telling. He said, you know, these CIA people, you know, they, they had the appearance of power. And that would certainly apply to McCord and Hunt. By, by their personal connection to Helms, they had the appearance of power. But Barker understood that once they were arrested, the CIA was going to disavow them. And there was nothing they could do. They could not blackmail Dick Helms. He, he wasn't going to put up with that. And uh, he was going to do what was good for his agency. And if that meant cutting his men loose, well, he would do it. And, and Barker understood that. That's what I was thought was significant about his comment to McCord. Yeah, and I mean, even reading the trial, trans trial transcript, actually, from the Miami burglars, they're still extremely loyal to CIA, refusing to fess up with any, any knowledge of CIA connections and saying, you know, I think I remember Barker saying he was sent money for the operation in a blank envelope with no address and no details who, who had sent it, you know. So um, I think uh, Judge Sirica had to kind of lean on them to, to get a waiver from CIA so they, they could actually, you know, make any progress and, and divulge any of this information. So that was quite striking, whether a fear of CIA or a, lo a loyalty or a bit of both. Um, okay, so we have another question here um, from Benjamin Hampton. Jeff, can you speak briefly about the theory that the Watergate burglars were attempting to attain documents related to the JFK assassination based on a conversation between Nixon and Helms from October 10, 1971? Uh, the, the only time I've heard that story is, is, is the story that Doug Caddy told yesterday, <clears throat> that he said Hunt had told him that, that they were looking for uh, Cuban government documents on JFK's assassination. I never knew what to make of that story. What, what documents would the Cuban government have? Um, uh, and why would they be in the, in the DNC? Um, so to me, that just seemed like another one of Howard Hunt's lines to get the Cubans excited about a national security mission. The reference to the October 8th, 1971 uh, conversation between uh, uh, Nixon and Helms, uh, I think does reference the JFK assassination. Not that, not that the, the, the burglars were in search of it, but um, Nixon was pressuring or threatening Helms with revelations about the JFK assassination. In, um, and in this meeting, where is the culmination of, of Nixon's efforts to obtain the CIA's secret files on the Bay of Pigs and the, and the CIA's reaction to it. The first thing he says to Nixon in terms of what, why he is interested in this material is, he says, the who shot John Angle. So Nixon clearly had Kennedy's assassination on his mind when he was seeking Bay of Pigs material from Helms. He never got it. Um, Helms gave him stuff about Diem, but not about the Bay of Pigs. Great, thanks. Um, I think I'll finish just with a general question about how the CIA was changed by Watergate. You know, after coming out of these two years of investigation, um, what, how was the agency changed after the Helms era, going into the Colby era? I think it's. I think one of the ironies is that Watergate actually wound up strengthening the CIA, and you know, it was partly the Colby approach was if you spread knowledge about covert operations among a wider leadership group including Congress, basically, um, you actually protected them and, and, and gave the agency more credibility and more leeway to do the kind of things that it wanted. And so the House and Senate Intelligence Committees are created in 1977. The FISA Court is created in 1978. This whole apparatus, which is resented by a lot of people at the CIA, actually becomes a way of pre preserving and protecting the CIA and, um, you know, and, and does not, in, in, turn, in the future, 
you know, prevent CIA abuses of power like the Iran-Contra affair or the torture regime. So really, you know, the CIA was, was very close to the brink. I think John's book about Colby describes this very well. The CIA was very close to the brink of losing legitimacy um, in Washington in 1975. And those sorts of actions brought it back from the brink and uh, enabled it to, to continue as a powerful Washington institution. Great. I would say, oh, please, John, so please, John. Since in at the last minute, yeah, that uh, I don't think the CIA learned that much from Watergate. I think, um, to the degree that we uh, buy the idea that the CIA was not involved in Watergate, uh, what goes with that is that the CIA didn't learn from Watergate. You know, now that's antithetical to what I just said about Colby having learned a little bit that helped him during the year of intelligence. But um, I think we have to also keep this other hypothesis in mind. Mm -hmm. And John, I mean, I, I can't resist following up. I mean, do you, do you think the CIA was involved in Watergate? Do you think they had any foreknowledge of the break-in uh, that Jeff's obviously alluded to earlier? Um, I don't know. I honestly don't know. Um, there is, uh, there's a thread in here that goes to the plumbers and goes to the anti Ellsberg operation that, uh, serves CIA interests in attacking an anti-war figure. And that might uh, suggest their concrete involvement. But um, I don't see anything to uh, lead them to want to be involved in wiretapping the Democratic National Committee and the political action jobs that were being carried out by the Hunt Liddy people who were the ones who led directly to the Watergate affair. So uh, I guess I have to say I'm agnostic. Okay, that's interesting. Jeff? If I could just say one, you know, I, 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 while I do think that the, the, there was a national security team led by Hunt and they did more operations than just Watergate, I don't think, or I saw, I found no evidence that people at CIA had foreknowledge that there would be a break-in at the Watergate specifically. So uh, I agree with John there. I, I, you just don't know, or, or you know, you, we, you, we can't tell. There's no evidence to, 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 um, to that effect. But the other, but the, I would, I, I think that the connection is great. And there's a, a Haldeman quote to Nixon in July, 1972, where he says to Nixon, talking about Hunt. Helms describes this guy as ruthless, quiet, and careful, low pro profile. He gets things done. He will work well with all of us. He's very concerned about the health of the administration. So Hunt came to the White House with a sterling job recommendation from Dick Helms a year before the burglary. I think that tells you a lot. It's interesting. Um, okay, yeah, I mean, I, I think, um... I'll throw over to Chris. Well, actually, the one thing I slipped my mind for a moment. Um, one thing that was interesting when I interviewed Roland and Martinez, the one point in the interview where, he, where I could feel he was stonewalling me was when I bro um, broached the subject of the Chile Chilean uh, embassy break-in that the uh -huh. are alleged to have been involved in. And he just said, you know, that was a no-go area. You know, if, if it hasn't <laughs> come out, it's not going to come out because I'm not going to talk about it. So that, that was a moment I felt like there was a strong possibility they were involved in that. And um, just to throw back to what Jeff was talking about earlier. Um, so I think we'll finish up with, with Chris, if you want to come in on the change. Well, I'm, I'm happy. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to defer to what, uh, what both John and, 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 um, and Jefferson said there, that, you know, they're, they're the subject specialists. And I, I would just sing a descant to what I said earlier. I think the, the lesson learned, certainly by Colby, as, as John expressed very eloquently, but, but also later by Stansfield Turner, was that there are instances where um, you need to lift the veil a little bit in order to, um, to deflect... Um, a mushrooming of public criticism and public speculation about what you do. 
that lesson was learned by Colby. It was learned by Stansfield Turner. Uh, and then, of course, it was overturned by Bill Casey. So um, it, 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 it was a lesson that was learned in the short term, perhaps, rather than the medium to longer term. Mm -hmm. Good point. And the other, the other thing that strikes me is actually Senator Howard Baker, um, who after, after doing his minority report, probing possible CIA involvement, then actually had a, a, a lesser known um, Baker report too, where he concluded that he'd done further investigation and was satisfied there wasn't the CIA involvement he had suspected. And then he became part of the Senate Intelligence Committee and kind of came back into the fold and was working again with CIA um, through the late 70s. So it's an interesting arc in terms of his involvement as well. well uh, one of the, um, I do apologize, Shane. Uh, yeah, what, 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 one of the, um, the rationales that David Attlee Phillips gave in 1975 for leaving the agency and setting up AFIO, the Association of Former Intelligence Officers, was that he felt that um, officers were, 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 were too gagged by the agency when it came to commenting on issues of public scandals. So he, he wrote a letter, to, a resignation letter to CIA employees saying, uh, you might think that I'm leaving you. You might think that I'm even betraying your cause, but, 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 but the reality could not be further from the truth. Actually, I'm leaving the CIA and I'm leaving to set up AFIO to defend you in the court of public opinion precisely from scandals like uh, like 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 Watergate. Um, so arguably, you know, one of the consequences was that that, that, that that yes, it led to a little bit more public affairs by the agency itself, but it also it also triggered a wave of, 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 of veterans writing books, doing speeches, going on the lecture circuits, um, contributing to that larger public discourse about intelligence. No, that's very true. And and your book, your book is a great source on, on some of that writing, obviously, as well. That's very yeah. kind. Yeah. OK, well, and th thanks very much. It's been a fascinating panel and we, we could go on. But unfortunately, we have another panel coming up in 24 minutes. So <laughs> uh, it's just been very, very stimulating and conference so far. So thanks to you all um, for participating and thanks to the audience for listening. It's been a, a really fascinating discussion. And uh, I'd recommend the books of all these gentlemen if you want to catch up on their, their research. Um, but we're going to leave it there. So thanks again for your input. And uh, our next panel is starting in 24 minutes. So please join us there. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much. Best Bye. wishes, John. Be best wishes, Jefferson. Yeah, take care, Christopher. Bye.